It is Valentine's Day. I mean, not close to Valentine's Day. I mean, today is Valentine's Day. And for those of you that braved the cold and the icy gravel roads and the icy roads here in Albernet, you get a special treat. Jeannie has two flowers for each of the ladies, and each of the gentlemen can get two of the treats that are down there. Not the trays. Chad already <laughs> tried that. But... Um, you can have two of the treats, gentlemen, and ladies, you can each have two flowers. And anybody else can have two, two. <laughs> <laughs> um, This morning, I thought it would be appropriate to look at the world's greatest valentine. And if you will, turn, I want to turn to a passage that every single one of us is familiar with. And as I look out there, probably every single one of you have memorized but I want to look at more depth at this verse because I think a lot of times we're so busy uh, reciting it that we don't actually think about what's in there. So in John 3, 16 and 17, it says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Almost 2,000 years ago, God sent the greatest valentine that the world could ever have received. God sent his very own son. This morning, I'd like to look at four things that we can see in God's greatest gift. Now, there's nothing new here this morning, but I think it is something that every one of us needs to be reminded of. Because as we come into contact with people, it's important that we can express to them who Jesus is and how we can come to have a personal relationship with him. And so I'm going to go over these. I'll try not to keep you guys way long this morning. Um, but we're going to quickly go through these four reasons, four things that we can see in God's greatest gift. The first is the motive. The motive that prompted the gift. So let's go back to John 3.16. It says, For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. You know, we live in a society today where the word love is so used and abused that a lot of times we don't really think about its real meaning. I mean, we love chocolate. We love the TV series that's on TV. We love the movie that we last saw. We use, we toss the word love around so easily that many times we lose sight of what it really, really means. In the Bible, there are at least three different words for the word love. There is the word phileo, which is the word that the city of Philadelphia comes from. Philadelphia actually means the city of brotherly love. And it is the kind of love that you have for your friends. It's a brotherly kind of love. There is eros love, which is sexual love in the Bible. The Bible also talks about a special kind of love. It's called agape love, and it is godly love. It is a love that is so deep, so real, so special, that in the Greek language it has its own name, and it's the kind of love that God has toward us. It's an unselfish love. And it's a love that loves simply because we are, not because we deserve it, or not because we have earned it. God loves us simply because we are. The Bible tells us that we were created in the very image of God. That there is, in that regard, a spark of God in us in that we have an eternal soul 
that will spend eternity in one of two places. The Bible doesn't say that about anything else that God has created. And as Christian people, we should strive to love other people in the same way that God loves us. Now, we'll never be completely successful at that, at least at the level that God is, right? But as Christian people, John tells us, the Apostle John tells us that it is by our love that people will know that we belong to Jesus Christ. We currently live in a time where I have never seen as much divisiveness and vitriol and hatred and anger, especially toward one guy, right? I mean, he's not even in office anymore, and they still can't let it go. And honestly, if we were truly honest, this last election was not about President Trump or Donald Trump and Joe Biden. It was about whether or not you liked Donald Trump or hated him. It really was more a referendum on the man, on one guy, than it was about any whether or not you really liked Joe Biden or whether you liked his policies or anything that he represented. I think if we were all really honest, this last election came down to whether or not you were voting for or against this guy. I mean, look at the division that is in our society today. And it's exact opposite of what Christ calls his church to be. He calls for his church to be united and to love one another and to love our enemies. And that's hard to do. But that's what sets us apart from the rest of the world. And that's what will draw people to Jesus. In the very founding of America, um, when I was in high school, we read an excerpt of a sermon, early American sermon. They probably wouldn't even let them do that today in our schools. But uh, the title of the sermon was Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And the preacher in his sermon had God, you know, uh, basically dangling people over the fires of hell just about ready to let go. I mean, I don't remember the exact wording of the sermon, but that's what I remember in, the, in my mind as I think back about this literature that we read in high school. You know, today, that kind of message really wouldn't work. I mean, we can turn on the television and we can see worse things than a minister could possibly conjure up in your mind, you know, in his message. What our world desperately needs to hear today is that there is somebody that loves them unconditionally, regardless of the mistakes that they've made and the decisions that they've made, and that he loves them enough that he let his one and only son die in order to bring him back to himself. That's the message that the world really needs to hear. And that's the message of John 3.16. That God so loved the world. The second thing that we can see is the preciousness of that gift. Back to John 3.16, I've underlined a different part of that. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Now, I, I love you guys. You are a part of my extended family. But as much as I love you, I would not uh, give up any of my children 
for you because I love them. I love you, Becca. Right? And I would venture to say that each of you are the same way. That even though we love and care for each other as a family, that we wouldn't sacrifice our children for each other. And that should just tell us how much that God loves us. I mean, you know, in the back of your mind, you may be saying, well, yeah, but God was going to raise him from the dead, you know, and, and he wasn't really going to be gone for forever. And, but I want you to understand something. When Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, as he is hanging on the cross, he cries out to God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? For all of eternity, there existed a relationship where they were never, ever separated. And as Jesus hung on the cross and bore the sins of all mankind, God could no longer look and turned away, and Jesus felt that separation that had never happened ever in eternity because of their love for us. Why do I say it's never ever happened before? Because in Scripture it says that this process of salvation is something upon which angels long to look. That tells me that God has never done anything like this before. If this had happened before with previous creations, it would just be old hat to the angels. But this is something different. This is something that they have never seen, and they long to look at this process of salvation that God has offered to human people. You know, if we read our Bible, what we discover is that angels and demons, they have made their choice as to who they're going to worship and who they're going to follow. But they get their punishment, their eternal punishment, at the same time we do. It's at the great judgment that Satan and his followers are cast into the lake of fire along with those who followed them. And I believe that God did that specifically so that we would have the ability to choose. Because if there was no evil, there would be no choice. But I want you to think about the preciousness of the gift that God gave. He gave his only son and watched him as he died on the cross for the forgiveness for, so that we could be forgiven. Now, moms, has the mama bear ever come out in you when your kids have been wronged? Have you ever marched yourself right over to set somebody straight when they've hurt your kids? Can you imagine if that's the way it is for us with our kids, how God felt as he watched them scorn his son and yell at Jesus on the cross and say, if you're really God's son, come down from that cross and prove it to us. Or when they mocked him, and flogged him with, with whips. Josephus said that when the Roman soldier scourged someone, if they survived, if they lived past the scourging, that they literally drugged their intestines behind them on the way to Calvary because there was nothing left to hold them in. Can you imagine what it was like for God 
to watch his son, to watch these human beings that he created abuse his son and know that if he stepped in, that that forgiveness could never be purchased. Think about how precious the gift was that God gave. Thirdly, and the purpose, the purpose of the gift. It says there, back to John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God gave the gift so that we could spend the rest of eternity with him. In the book of Romans, it tells us that God was not content just to forgive our sins, but that he's also adopted us into his family and made us sons and daughters and co-heirs with Jesus Christ. In other words, we get to inherit the same thing that Jesus gets to inherit. That's what a co-heir is. Someone who also inherits what somebody else gets. God wasn't content just to say, okay, I'm going to forget that you, that you, you know, uh, sinned. I'm not only going to forgive you, I'm going to adopt you, and I'm going to allow you to inherit what I have to offer. Is that not amazing? Is that not incredible? You know... We cling to this life because it's all that we know. We've never known anything different. But I sometimes can't help but think about Bill Gaither's lyrics to the song that says, Eye is not seen, ear is not heard, all the things that God has in store for those that love the Lord, where he says that, you know, if God created everything that's here in his song in seven days, Think about what he's been up to for the last 2,000 years. I mean, heaven's going to be this amazing, extraordinary place. And I, I could be wrong. I can't point to book, chapter, and verse. But I think that when we're there, the bodies that we will receive will be like the bodies that we are had, well, like Gavin has now. You know, an adult body, uh, you know, in my mind, I picture like, you know, 21, 22 years of age um, where you're adult, but you don't have any of the aches and the pains and the ill things that we struggle with at 50 and 60 and 70 and 80, right? It's going to be a wonderful place. God gave the gift so that we wouldn't perish, but that we could have eternal life with him. The fourth thing that we can see is the condition upon which the gift can be enjoyed. The condition upon which the gift can be enjoyed. Let me go back one last time, but you didn't think that I could make a whole sermon out of one verse, did you? <laughs> For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him, believes in him, shall not perish but have eternal life. Now, there's more than one kind of belief. There is the mental assent that we say, yeah, I believe that this is true, but it doesn't really ever change our life. You know, when they... When they say that electricity, that, that what causes your lights to come on when you flip that switch, 
is that there's these little electrons in the wire that push through there and actually cause those lights to come on. I believe that. I believe that to be true. I don't understand it, but I believe it, right? Um, but it doesn't really affect the way that I live my life unless I'm trying to wire without the electricity being off. Now, there's another kind of belief that we have, and that's gravity. And I believe in gravity. And my belief in gravity says that when I step outside there and I get off of the pavement that's been salted, I'm going to walk careful. Because if I slip, gravity is going to bring me to the ground and it's going to hurt a lot. And so I don't walk the same way on ice that I walk on bare pavement. Because I believe in gravity and it changes the way that I behave. The kind of belief that John is talking about here in John 3.16 is not mental assent. Not the thing that says, yes, I believe that there's a God out there somewhere. It's the kind of belief that changes the way that I live my life. When Melanie and I were just dating, we went to a park. We were traveling with the school and we would sing and one of the professors would speak for the college. And they took us out to this park and they had this like fire type tower that you could go up and you could, you know, observe observation tower. And it was high enough that Dan Peterson stood in the middle of the tower and Bethany or Melanie is hanging over the edge of the railing kind of thing. And I'm like, get back here. <laughs> right. Because I have this tremendous respect for heights <laughs> and I don't ever want to fall. And heights don't bother Melanie at all. That's just not something that bothers her. You know, but uh, m m belief involves changing the way that you act. Biblical belief does. In Acts 2.38, it says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. See, not only do I have to believe that Jesus is God's son, but I have to change the way that I live my life. You see, belief alone is not enough. The Bible says in James that even the demons believe and tremble, but not one of us here would claim that a demon is saved. Repentance is a military term that means about face. It means that I'm going in one direction and I change my action and I go the other way. So if I believe that Jesus is God's son, that he was sent to provide forgiveness of my sins, it means that I have to change my actions and that I no longer continue to do the sin that I did. Does that mean that I'll never sin again? Absolutely not. But as I look at my life, I should see as I continue as a Christian, decreasing frequency in sin. In other words, I sin less today than I did a year ago or two years ago or five years ago. If, if I believe that Jesus called me to be his disciple, but I never change the way that I live my life, do I have the kind of belief that changes my action or I just have the kind of belief that's mental assent? Are you with me? It says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There are some who believe that uh, believing, repenting, and is, is enough in order to be saved. But Peter, as he gave the very first gospel message, not only did he call them to repent, but he called them to be baptized. And it is a process in our church where we immerse people because it is symbolic of a death and a burial and a resurrection. It symbolizes that as that person comes up, they are a new creature in Jesus Christ. 
something that you don't get simply by sprinkling. The word baptism is actually comes from the Greek word baptizo, which means to dunk or to immerse. And when and, uh, King James wanted to have the Bible translated from Latin to English, the church was, of England was already sprinkling. And so rather than translate that literally, they just carried that word baptizo over into the English language and changed it a little bit and made it baptism or baptize. In Acts 2.38, it says, not only do we need to repent, but we need to be baptized. Romans 10.10 says, For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. Jesus said, If you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father who is in heaven. If you're not willing to confess Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life, then you don't have the kind of belief that changes your actions. You have the kind of belief that's mental assent. So we need to hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. In back to Acts 2.38. He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for, th for the forgiveness of your sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever noticed that in Acts 2.38, there's two commands and there's two promises. Repent and be baptized are the commands. And the promises are the forgiveness of our sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit will come and dwell inside of us and help us as we try to live out our life as Christians, as we try to become more like Jesus Christ. It really is the greatest gift, the greatest valentine that the world has ever received when God sent his son into this world. And the beauty of it is, as long as there is life and breath in your body, you have the ability to choose Jesus. But when your life here on earth is over, whatever decision you've made, whether it's to accept Jesus or whether it's to reject him, either openly or by not making a decision at all, that decision will be set for all of eternity. The Bible says it is appointed unto a man to die once and then comes judgment. I implore you to make sure that you accept the gift. Accept the gift that God is offering through his one and only son.